Hello everybody, it's me, V, or White Zulu, and welcome to another piece of my life experience taken from my autobiography of the same name. Now you might notice that instead of lying in bed, as I have done for the past 12 years, but as long as I've been doing these recordings with John, I'm now sitting up in my new wheelchair, so I'm able to look like a proper presenter rather than lying in a bed propped up on a very painful left arm. So that is the difference that it makes to me. And I just feel wonderful. This has been the best thing that's ever happened to me is getting this wheelchair. It took eight months between ordering it and receiving it. But my GP sat on the paperwork for three months and didn't bother to. He could have actually given this to me 12 years ago, but didn't bother to tell me it was available. It was only through a friend of mine who had one, and I asked her how much it cost. She said, nothing. You get it for free on the NHS. So here I am in my wheelchair and ready to roll. Now, this is White Zulu Chapter 47, leaving school at last, then flying to Lisbon with my father to attend finishing school in Switzerland. The exams finished and it was our last night at school. We went carol singing and had a party in the house common room hosted by the fifth formers. It was wonderful. By that time, I'd had a brief discussion with mum and dad as to what I'd do when I left school. The subject of passing my trick was avoided by everybody, especially me. And dad said, you'll go to finishing school in Swiss Switzerland, just like your sisters did. What if I want to go to university like all the others in my class are, I asked. No, the universities are full of communists, said Dad firmly. And that was the end of the discussion. This was simply because there had been some mild protests against apartheid perpetrated by some of the students scattered around in the various universities in South Africa. However, I don't know why it bothered my father so much because he was the biggest racist on this planet. And being a farmer, he had quite a bit of reason to be one. Now that I wasn't allowed to go to varsity like my peers, I suddenly decided to reclaim my yen to be a vet. I want to go to university and be a vet, I told Dad during a Sunday out. The only veterinary college in this country is in Pretoria at Ornestupoort, and it's full of Afrikaners. Forget it, I was told. It's not ladylike to be a vet anyway. It's a man's job. I decided to lower my sights and keep to the curriculum of the more local English medium, Natal University in Peter Maritzburg. But no, teaching and nursing were out as well, too common for the likes of us. I was puzzled. Why all the fuss about making me take my matric and then sending me off to the same place my two older sisters had gone. It wasn't fair. They dropped out of school and left in fifth form. At least I thought my parents could allow me to use my qualifications. Secretly, though, I was quite pleased as I didn't have much hope of passing the university entrance exams with the pitiful amount I'd written on my papers. On our school leaving day, we were milling around the main corridor, saying goodbye to everybody, 
staff included. I found myself in front of Malt, that notorious butch lesbian games mistress. I said goodbye to her and out of politeness, she had to ask me what I was going to do when I left school. All the other teachers were being very pleasant and showing an interest in our future. So she must have felt obliged to ask me. I'm going to finishing school to learn French and skiing, I replied. Mort snorted with disgust before she realized that she had to be civil, gave me a final bloodshot glare and shook my hand with her leathery nicotine stained paw. We had our sixth form dance and I enjoyed myself with the friend's brother. He was a genial young man, five years older than I was and had been at Hilton College. At the end of the dance, when he dropped me off at our cousin's home in Kloof, where I was staying, I didn't know what to do. He wasn't my boyfriend, as I already had Greg. To the merriment of my cousins, who were watching furtively from the front veranda, I was teased mercilessly by all of them for not kissing my date. I'd shaken hands with him instead. Flying to Lisbon. On Boxing Day, a month before my 18th birthday, Dad and I set off to fly to Rome and Madrid before he left me with my new Swiss family. I was dressed in a tweed suit, cream blouse with stockings and matching black leather low-heeled court shoes and handbag, and carrying a thick camel hair coat over my arm, boarded a South African Airways Vickers, Vis, Vis, Vickers Viscount bound for Lisbon, our first stop. It was one of Durban's hottest days, summer days, with a humidity of 100% and no different from a sauna. But that's how one traveled in the 60s. It was still the smartest form of transport, far more up more upmarket even than a first class cabin on the castle line mail ships and everybody wore their best for the occasion. Dad was in a dark winter Savile Row suit and just as hot, sweaty and uncomfortable as I was. He was longing for his first gin and was as grumpy as I was excited. By no stretch of the imagination was Dad my ideal travelling partner for my first trip overseas. But realistically, if I'd been sent off on my own, God knows where I would have ended up, in white slavery probably, as that was one of the big fears doing the rounds in the 1960s. Apparently, there were dealers in disguise lurking everywhere with the sole aim of snatching young white girls to be sold onto rich Arabs in the Middle East. I would have been a perfect target as I was hopelessly under-equipped to be let loose in the world outside St Anne's or New Forest, our farm. I still hadn't yet crossed a street by myself and I was nearly 18. I was still living in my own little world as well. To survive the mind-numbing boredom of the lonely life which I'd spent on the farm when my Zulu playmates had been banished back to Mbentla in 1961 and I'd been sent to the prep and then six years at the college, I'd created my own pleasant world in my head. 
with my lively imagination and plenty of uninterrupted time on my hands while I sat in class, chapel or prep. Even when I rode my horses out onto the hills with just the dogs for company, I'd given myself an unlimited future, which include flying a fighter jet once I'd somehow got around my myopia problem. I decided the fleet air arm would be perfect for me as it involved battleships, another of my favorites, as well as aircraft. This was before aircraft carriers became the standard method of landing planes at sea. As far as marriage went, I still had my prince in his castle, even though I was in love with Greg and he didn't have a castle yet, but that didn't seem to pose any problems. I'd kept my veterinary dream and had amalgamated what that with piloting a small zebra-striped single-engined Cessna into the Serengeti to tend to wildlife in trouble. I would hand raise sick, injured and orphaned white animals, wild animals and birds in my own locally built thatched home there, bottle feeding the youngest baby mammals while predators prowled the premises at night. Eventually I would set all the creatures I'd saved free and back into the wild. I had whiled away the six weeks of Christmas summer holidays in these delightful daydreams, embellishing them as I roamed the farm on rocket. I'd also entertained the idea of being a prima ballerina after reading some of Nicolette's books about famous ballet dancers like Margot Fontaine particularly, as I loved the costumes, all those spangles and the gorgeous frilly tutus. I had once or twice had a couple of ballet lessons at the Moy River Farmers Association Stockyard Hall, driven there by Mum after she'd picked us up from the government school on the odd afternoon and had absolutely loved them. Sadly, there were no sequined net tutus and we had to wear plain black leotards, pink tights and black pumps. But I had applied myself to all the beginner's feet and arm positions, as well as the bar exercises with all my heart. I was graceful and could have been a good dancer if it hadn't been for two problems. One was my growing to five foot eight in less than a year and thus becoming incredibly skinny and gangly, but with a D-cup bosom. And the other was mum getting fed up with having to hang around for the hour or so, which our lessons took instead of being in her beloved garden. The final straw had come when we had to drive home in a thunderstorm, a torrential one, forcing us to put chains on the recalcitrant and cumbersome, cumbersome Pontiac, so hopelessly unsuitable for those mud roads, and getting two punctures as a result of Jomela's habit of always mending the broken links of all our chains with barbed wire. Dealer and I crawled around in the ankle deep gooey red mud under the car in the pelting rain, which was interspersed by blinding bolts of lightning, striking terrifyingly close to us, followed by deafening cracks of thunder, trying to fit the chains only to be rewarded with an explosive pop and a loud hissing noise coming from the tires on both occasions. 
while mum yelled at us to hurry up. Our ballet outfits were ruined and her temper was way beyond breaking point. And that was the end of our dancing lessons forever. Books about famous show jumpers and wonderful novels like Jump, actually it was an autobiography, like Jump for Joy about girls like me who lived for their ponies and eventually became Olympic competitors in show jumping. I knew this was definitely a pipe dream, as I couldn't even get Dad to take Rocket to Gymkhana in the horse box when he still had one to ferry his polo ponies around in it. On the plane, all my questions were met with monosyllabic grunts, but Dad had perked up enough to point out to me that the pilot wore four gold bands on his jacket sleeves than the co-pilot who wore only three as we watched them do their pre-flight checks through the open door of the cockpit. This was long before the days of security and after checking our baggage in and showing an official our passports, we simply strolled out of the terminal and across the lava-like heat of the runway and climbed the steps into the aircraft, our small overnight bags with our coats over our arms. There was no in-flight movie, but plenty of free drink to keep Dad mellow. And after a fairly decent supper, I spent the rest of the time gazing out of the porthole at the pitch blackness of Africa beneath me. We landed for refueling at Luanda, the capital city of in Angola, having had to circle the airport for 20 minutes or so while someone chased a few stray camels off the runway before we could land. The Angolan heat blasted us in the face as we climbed out to stretch our legs while the airport authorities spayed, sprayed the entire interior of our cabin with a noxious insecticide, mainly to eradicate killer mosquitoes, which carried both yellow fever and malaria which made me sneeze and my eyes water for the rest of the flight. This was all in the middle of the night, pitch dark. We'd, have, we'd had to have all kinds of inoculations two weeks before we left South Africa, none of which exists today. We arrived in Lisbon on a grey, overcast day, and as we stepped down onto the tarmac, the ice-cold air hit me in the face like a bucket of freezing water. I couldn't get my coat on fast enough after having silently cursed having to carry it in the humid Durban heat. We were proceeding through immigration to transfer, transfer to a flight to Rome where Dad had arranged for us to spend a few days when the most extraordinary sight met my eyes. It was a white woman pushing a broom across the floor. I was flabbergasted and stood and stared in disbelief. I'd never in my entire life seen a white person sweeping a floor. That's all for this time. There's more to come. We're changing our format a little bit. I just want to thank John Moslane uh, for putting aside his Friday afternoons to do these videos with me. And also Sean van Furen for uploading them and doing a sterling job there.
And if you want any more information, please go to my website at www.whitezulubook.com. I will explain to you, my viewers, that we have now completed my school days and are moving on to my year in Switzerland and my learning to be a lady. We've gone back two years and have reverted to the pre-recorded videos I did for the Loving Life channel. And that explains why we have a slightly different format going forward. We've cut them in half to make them easier to listen to. I hope you enjoyed this particular piece. And there's um, now Switzerland, well, first of all, Rome, where we had some adventures there. And then on to Switzerland to settle down. To, and I'll tell you more in the next session. They, these will all be pre-recorded ones. So. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this and be prepared for a girl who'd spent her life on the farm, isolated from everybody and then sent to boarding school for six years and a very strict one. Definitely no boys. Suddenly to be let loose and run with the wolves as I did and learn every bad habit I could in the next piece. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you again. Goodbye.